I want to invite you to go to the book of Hebrews with me again this morning. We started in this chapter last week, and we're going to continue to walk through this passage together. And the focus uh, of verses 9 through 13 this morning are emphasizing to us, as is much of this passage, of who Jesus was, who Jesus of Nazareth that was of the region of Galilee, who he was when he died on the cross. And the, the biggest question in your life that you will ever give an answer for is who you believe Jesus Christ is. Many people have different opinions and different ideas of who Jesus is. You can ask several different uh, uh, religious people and you'll get several different answers of who Jesus is. Within the context of this passage of, of Hebrews, it's a book that talks about how Jesus is better. Jesus is better than any other system, any other being that we could ever look to for hope and salvation. He is better. And in the beginning of the book, it talks and speaks about how Jesus is better than the angels. It goes on to talk about how Jesus is better than Moses, who God used to uh, bring the law to the children of Israel and to bring the, the Ten Commandments to all of humanity to show them their sinfulness. But yet Jesus is better. He's better than even the Old Testament law. In the Old Testament covenant, Jesus is better than all these things. The psalmist said in Psalm 86, 8, that among the gods there is none like unto thee. There's none among the gods, there's none of, of the heavenly beings that are greater than Jesus Christ. There's none like him. There's not a savior like him that you can find in this earth and in the heavens above us. There is none like Jesus Christ. We see this life and this earth, and while we are trying to navigate through and we're trying to uh, accomplish things with our life, we're trying to make a difference, we're trying to have hope just to live another day, and yet constantly we are failing and we are falling short of things that we would desire or falling short of solutions that we as mankind want to bring to have hope to live in the days that we have to live but scripture says in the midst of all of this our hope is not in the things that we see around us or the men that bring solutions to us but as it says in uh, the book of hebrews verse 9 we see jesus but we see jesus we see not all things under the dominion of man. We see things that are out of control by man, but we see Jesus. You see, it took one man to bring condemnation upon all of mankind, but then it took one man to bring salvation to all of mankind. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Yes, Jesus is better than any other system of belief and religion that offers hope. Because Jesus is the only one that has charted a path and a course into death that comes through death. There is no, no other leader of any other religion that has made it through death as Jesus has for you and for me. I have spoken to those who live here in our city and in our communities, and uh, no doubt you have as well, that have very different uh, ideas of what salvation means, of what hope means, of, of what eternity means. And in speaking with many, you, you can talk to those who uh, uh, claim to be a Jehovah's Witness, those who are witnesses of, of Jehovah God, and they will have a lot of good things to say. They'll send a, an Easter invitation into your mailbox, and they will promote a message of hope and peace to you. But you begin speaking with them a little further, and you begin asking this one question, this one question that divides men and women, this one question that divides whole families, this one question that divides not just our nation, but divides our world. You ask them, but who is Jesus Christ? And suddenly the conversation isn't so agreeable anymore. Suddenly the message of hope and peace isn't so straightforward anymore. A Jehovah's Witness will tell you that Jesus was a good man. Oh, he was a great prophet, but he was only that. He was not God who came to us in the flesh. 
You can talk to the Mormons and they will tell you that uh, Jesus, yes, he was a great man who lived on earth. We can agree about that. But Jesus was just a man just like you and me. He became a God, but he became a God that you can become also. You can become just as Jesus Christ became. You can talk to uh, uh, relig- uh, those who hold to religion both here in uh, our Western cultures and Western Hemisphere. You can talk to those of Eastern religions. And this one question of who is Jesus is what, is what defines true biblical hope and false hope in man's religion. Who is Jesus Christ? You see, the message that we are given to bring to our city, to our communities, to our neighborhoods that we live in, the singular purpose and reason that God has left us here, not yet taken us to heaven, is to show who Jesus Christ is. That others would see who Jesus is. That the, that the purpose to our gathering here today and the purpose of Crossway Baptist Church and all that we do with its varying ministries and, and capacities uh, that we operate in throughout a year, the purpose of everything is to explain who Jesus Christ is. If we are not allowing others to see Jesus for who he really is, we are wasting our time. We are wor- our worship is in vain. Our ministry to our city and to our communities is in vain. If we are not clearly identifying who Jesus Christ is. We're not just seeking to give people hope this Easter. We're not just seeking to give a message of peace uh, to people. We are seeking to explain who is Jesus Christ. The only way that Jesus can save an individual from their sins and from eternal condemnation upon their lives in a lake of fire is for an individual to recognize that Jesus was God made in human flesh hanging upon the cross for all of men and that he died for all men. He died for me and he died for you. Who is Jesus? This passage describes for us so clearly Jesus Christ, who he was, in that he was God and yet he was man. He became one of us, though he had all the deity and worship of God himself. Jesus, who was this man that was crucified some 2,000 years ago? I want you to realize and have this hope so firmly gripping your heart today that as we walk through this week of uh, leading up to Easter, It would burn within your heart and you would sit and meditate and think on who Jesus Christ of Nazareth that died on the cross, who he truly is. To to think on these truths that are given to us from Hebrews chapter 2. I want you to notice firstly in verse 9 there that Jesus is the Lord of the angels realm though he was made lower than the angels. Verse number 9 tells us, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God should taste death for every man. It doesn't seem quite right that a God who claims to be a Lord of all creation should be taken by his creation, made subordinate to his creation, made lower than his creation, and put to death. It doesn't make sense that there is any conqueror or king that should be a king at all who cannot overcome his his foe, who seemingly was put to death by those who were weaker and less than him. But understand that when the Bible says that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, does not mean that Jesus left his ownership of his creation. Jesus was made lower in the order of things on this earth, but he was not. uh, He did not lose his ownership of his creation. Because when Jesus Christ came, he came with glory and honor. He lived a life. You know, not everything on this earth is corrupt. Not everything on this planet is something that, that is utterly in its core evil. Jesus Christ lived a perfect sinless life. The life that Adam and Eve were created to live, that they failed to live, that that they lost that that crown of glory and honor, and they traded it for a crown of thorns and, uh, and of the curse of sin upon their lives. Jesus came and he lived the life that Adam and Eve never did. Jesus Christ came to live the life that you and I will never live in our own strength and ability. Jesus Christ came and he proved 
that he was, though he made in, in the flesh of men, made in a lesser glory than that of the angels, he proved his authority over the angels when he came. He, being uh, led away in the Garden of Gethsemane, stopped Peter from killing the servants of the high priest. and said, do you not know that if I were to call 10,000 angels, they would come? He had all authority over angels. That when, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it was the angels that showed up in the skies that manifested their glory, a glory given to them by the one who was born in a manger, and they worshipped him. They cried the glory, the glory of the highest that had come to mankind. Look in your Bible there to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. It is said of Jesus Christ by God himself, God the Father. It says in Hebrews 1, 6, that again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. Unto, uh, and of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. The angels are ministers of God, but the angels worship Jesus Christ. But unto the Son, it says in verse 8, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Jesus is righteous. Jesus is Lord of the angels, and they worship him, though he came in a, in a glory and in a body lesser than that of the angels. Jesus came and proved his authority over sickness and disease when he healed the blind and the lame. He proved himself to be the God of the natural elements of the world that we live in when he came and he stilled the waters on the Sea of Galilee. He proved himself to be one that had authority over sin when he forgave the sin of the man who was, uh, 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 was paralyzed and could not walk. He proved himself to be the one who had authority over death when he raised Lazarus from the grave. Oh, he came in a body that was lesser than that of the angels. He submitted himself to, to the law and, and to the way of life of, as we, uh, as mankind. But time and time again, there were the instances where he proved he owned all these things. Though he came in a body lesser than that of the angels. You see, by the grace of God, Jesus did this for you and for me to redeem the glory and honor that we lost when mankind rebelled against God and sinned in the Garden of Eden. And sin came upon all men, because that all have sinned. All have come short of the glory of God, and therefore all will die. Yet Jesus came and took on our flesh. It says, by the grace of God, he came to taste death for every man. There is a horrible, dreaded day if the Lord does not return, that you and I are going to experience an experience we are not looking forward to. It's that experience of death. It's that experience of having your last look at this world. It's the experience of you breathing your last breath. And we wonder what will we feel. We wonder what will we see in that split instant of our soul departing from this body. Horrible, awful experience. One that we've witnessed in the lives of others. One that is yet to come for us. But by the grace of God, there is one who has experienced that death. There is one that has gone through the suffering and pain and agony of this life, of injustice, of evil reigning upon him. There is one that has gone into death by the grace of God for you, for every man by the grace of God. Scripture says he has tasted death. He has gone through that experience. In order that he entering into that experience could go through that experience so that when you come to death, you can follow Jesus through that valley of the shadow of death and come out the other side victorious. He's the only one by the grace of God that has tasted death for every man. Every man tastes death for, him own, for his own sake, for him own, his own self. No one can go through death for you. 
but know that if you have received Christ in your heart for salvation, when death comes, you don't go to death alone. You go to death following the one who went to death before you did and came out the other side alive and is even at the right hand of God the Father today, and he will bring you there when you come to death if he should tarry his coming. We have that hope by the grace of God and that he is in, in being made lower than the angels, taking on the form of human flesh. It was necessary that he do so in order that he could go through your experience of death, that he could make a way for you that when you come to death are able to go to the Father, though he was made lower than the angels. It's a marvel. Verse number 10 describes for us how that Jesus is the captain of man's salvation, though he was made the captive of men. Verse number 10 there, Hebrews chapter 2, it explains to us of Jesus that it became him, meaning that it was fitting, it was suitable, it was something that it, it just fits, it just looks right, it's something that is becoming of him. In the same way that when Jesus came to uh, the, uh, the Jordan River to be baptized of John the Baptist, John the Baptist said, oh Lord, I, I cannot baptize you, I need to be baptized of, of you, Lord. I'm not worthy to take your sandals off. You are my Lord and my God. And yet Jesus said, suffer it to be so. Be come with us to fulfill all righteousness. It, it becomes us to do all that the Father has willed and commanded for us to do. And this passage is saying that it became him. It was fitting that it should be Jesus that would be the one. That it would be, it would be him that would come for mankind. Why? Well, it it's explains for us that it was for whom are all things. It became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Listen, everything is for Jesus Christ. And so it's fitting that he should be interested in mankind to redeem him, to save him from sin. All things were created by Jesus Christ. And so it's fitting that he should be the one that should be interested in redeeming mankind back to himself. When man has sinned and, and gone his own way, gone down his own path, it, it is becoming of Jesus, it is fitting that he should be the one that should come to mankind. And by the way, in him being the one for whom all things are for, and the one in which all things are made, you are his special creation. Jesus didn't die on the cross for your pet cat. Jesus didn't die on the, on the cross for the cows. Jesus didn't die on the cross to redeem this earth. There's coming a day when all that we see, this creation around us, will come to an end. And it will be completely made, in, a, 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 a new heaven, a new earth will be made. This one will cease to exist. It will be no more. But you are special in the eyes of God. That in all of his creation, uh, of the earth and the heavens above, he sees you as the one being that he has created to live with him for all eternity. That the justice of Jesus demands that when man sins, he, may, he must pay for his sins. He must die for his sins. He is a just savior. But in Jesus decreeing that man must die for his sins, Jesus says, I will go and die for him. I will die for those sins that he ought to die for. In that he being a, a just savior, he is a savior full of mercy and love. That in bringing a solution to his special creation of mankind, he came, it was fitting for him to come, to be made in our flesh, to be taken in, into the hands of men, to be crucified, and that he was died there on the cross. He didn't just die as a man. And he didn't only just die as God that came from heaven, made in man's flesh, but he died there as your sin upon the cross. Not just your sin of yesterday and not just of today, but all sin that has ever been committed by you and of all of mankind. He died there as your sin, the sacrifice, the payment for your sin. Though he is the captain of our salvation, he, he is the one that uh, is the author of salvation. The, the idea of the Greek word that is behind our English word captain in verse number 10, that he is the captain of our salvation, is the idea that 
he is leading in that he, he is a, a leader of the sons of men, of all of mankind. Jesus is the one that leads them to victory. He is the one who is the author of the plan of salvation. He is the one who came to finish the task of salvation. He is the one who is the example of how to overcome sin and death for every man. He is the captain of our salvation. He is a true leader. You know what? A, a true leader is, is a person who sees the enemy, sees danger. And a true leader will go out and he will face the danger head on and invite others to come as he goes forward before them. A phony leader, a leader that is a hypocrite, a leader that is, uh, that is nothing of the truth that is found in God is a leader who sees the danger, sees the enemy, and sees that there's, there's glory beyond the enemy. If we can just get across the enemy to the other side, there's victory. But instead of, the, uh, 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 of him as it being a phony leader going and leading others to go, blaze a trail through the enemy and get to the other side, he sends others to make a way for him. He, sa- he sends others to make a sacrifice so that those who are of prominent position and title can have a safe passage through. Not Jesus Christ, not your Lord, that when he saw the enemy and he saw sin and he saw the payment that you had to pay, he said, I will go and I will blaze a path through sin, through death. And he says, all that will come after me will follow that path into life everlasting. Jesus came to be the one that would make the way through the power of death, the devil, and sin. It's a little bit like when I was a teenager, we went to youth group, and we played this crazy game. Young people, don't try this at home. I don't know why we play this game, but uh, we did have a lot of fun playing it. It It's called Red Rover, Red Rover. And all us kids would line up holding, we had two teams, and and, uh, one team would line up holding hands together, and they'd be strewn across a a grassy uh, uh, a yard perhaps, holding hands as tight as they could. And the other team would be on the other side uh, of the yard and, and they, uh, those who were holding hands would cry, Red Rover, Red Rover! And that other team would begin running towards that line uh, of linked arms. And it was always fun to watch. It wasn't fun to be the one, but it was fun to watch. You know, there, there were those who began to charge against that line and uh, they'd kind of go timidly. Because they, they knew in themselves, I'm not going to be able to break through this line. I'm not strong enough to break through this line. And they kind of walked timidly and just, and just softly bump into the line. And, and when you became, if you couldn't break through the line, well, then you became a part of the chain. You became a part of that line. And they just kind of meekly just surrender themselves. But then, then there were some, you know, that are overconfident. Well, I, I can break through this chain. I can break through those two people there holding arms. I mean, they, would, you, they were they built up with confidence and they ran determinedly and they would run full force for that line and bam, right on the ground. They, 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 if you've ever seen someone get clotheslined before, you get hit in the chest, you go flat on your back in an instance. They had the wind knocked out of them. Again, I, kids don't play this game at home. But then if you were part of the team that was running towards the line and you had someone that was bigger than you, And you had someone that you knew, they're stronger than anyone else who's holding their hands together. What do you do? I'm getting behind that person. I'm following this person. I'm going through, but it's not going to be because I'm strong enough. I'm going to follow this person straight through. And that is who Jesus is for you. That is who Jesus is for me. He is the one that is stronger than the power of sin. He He can overcome it. It is befitting that he should be the one that should die for men. Of all the men who have ever been born into this life, it makes sense. And it is fitting that Jesus should be the one that should go to the cross and rise from the grave. Because he's the only one that could do that. Being a man born of women into this world. It's fitting that it should be God. Because only God is sinless and holy and perfect. There is no man who has not had a wrong thought towards God or towards his brother. There is no man that has not spoken a word that that is is perfect and holy all the time before God and, and mankind. It is fitting that it should be Jesus, who is the captain of our salvation, not in that he was the only one that could pass through sin and death for us, but that he is the one who had the plan in the first place. 
He is the one that in creating mankind designed that when he knew they would fall, he planned to come at an appointed time to be born of a woman, yet of the Holy Spirit of God, to live a life that would end up on a cross and that him dying when we come to our death, if the Lord should tarry, we can enter into death knowing we follow Jesus Christ. He is the one that can go through the valley of the shadow of death. He's the one that can go through uh, the power of sin and the power of the devil and bring us to that glory and honor that Jesus designed his creation, mankind, to have in his life. He is no phony leader. He is no fake. He went himself and experienced himself what you and I will face to bring us through. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He didn't just make the plan. He is the plan. And he is the completion of the plan of salvation. He is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of God. What was it that drove Jesus to the cross to be willing to suffer as a man? What was it that he as the son of God was willing to put, put, place himself on the cross? How the father turned his back on him, being separated from God. You and I who have received Jesus will never know what that's like. You'll never know what it's like to spend an eternity in, in, in darkness and in suffering and pain. You will never know what that's like because Jesus went through that experience for you. He knew what it was to have the Father's back turned. Every one of us has received mercy from the, from the day of our first existence in this life and that the Father has always been pointed towards us. His face has always been towards us. He has continually been showing mercy towards us even when we have resisted his salvation. Even after receiving his salvation, we have gone after our own dreams and desires in this life. His face is still pointing towards us. His back has never been against us because Jesus went through an experience to save you from that. He is the only one that could go through death Pay sin's price, redeem us back to the Lord. Someone explained it in this way that if you were on a ship that had become broken upon the rocks and you could see the shoreline, but it was dangerous to go there. The storm is raging, the, the, the waves are crashing down, there, there are logs and objects in the water that if you were to jump in, you, you, you are uh, most likely going to be uh, knocked out by them. The waves would be too great that you could not swim through them to the land. But there was one man on the ship who had the strength and the ability to jump out of the boat, swim through the danger, swim, swim through those, those, those dark and raging waves in, in the black of night, and was able, with a rope tied to himself, able to swim from that boat to the shore and secured that line to the shore so that those who were on the boat could grab hold of that rope and follow through that raging sea and through those raging uh, 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 storm that went on and be able to get to the shore. That is Jesus for you and I. He did what none of us could do. He makes a way to the Father in heaven by the power of being God himself. Quickly, lastly, verse number 11, Jesus is the sanctifier of the believer's life though he was made a son with believers. I can't quite comprehend how Jesus is my life. I have no life apart from Jesus, and yet he's my brother. He was made as a man just as I am, and just as you are. He, he is fully God, yet being made in human flesh, he took part of our experience in this life. He knows what it is to live through the difficulties of a sin-cursed life. He knows what it is to face death when life comes to an end. And yet he was fully God. He, 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 he knew what it was to be in the glory of the Father in heaven. Verse number 11 tells us here that, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. To sanctify has the meaning of something that is taken and, and it's made clean for a particular use, a special use. It's a little bit like uh, in my home growing up, my mom, and she still has to this day, 
some special dishware that sits in cabinets with glass doors. They're, they're made clean. They're put behind uh, glass doors so that they can stay clean. And those dishes rarely ever came out of there except for special use. Special celebrations of family coming together, special guests perhaps that would come to the house. They were sanctified. They were cleaned and they were put in a clean place ready to be used for a specific purpose. And Jesus, by his own power, has made mankind clean by the blood that he shed on Calvary. But he has not just made you clean. He has set you in a very special place, prepared and ready to be used by God the Father, to do his work, to, to minister for him in this life. He has sanctified us, is what the passage says. But it says, he that sanctifieth, and them who are sanctified, who, who, who is us, they're all of one. Well, how are they one? Because Jesus, though he was God, he lived our life. He died our death. He became one of us and even became our very sin. He became our brother. The wonder of Jesus Christ and the wonder of the cross this Easter is that Jesus is your God who died on the cross for you. But at the same time, he is your brother that died on the cross for you. He knows what it is to be in the glory of God Almighty, but he knows what it is to be under the curse, under the thorns, under the shame of your sin. He knows what that is. The, the, the blackest heart, the most wicked of men that has ever lived on this planet, Jesus knows what it is to live with that kind of sin and shame because he bore that sin and shame on the cross for every man by the grace of God. He knows what it is to be human. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 13.12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. He, being man, but yet God, died on the cross in our place. And the passage goes on to uh, dive deeper by pointing us back to the Old Testament. Listen, people tell you the Old Testament doesn't matter. The Old, the Old Testament isn't about Jesus. It's about the, uh, the God, the Father in heaven and his great wrath. No, the Old Testament is all full of Jesus. The Old Testament and the New Testament is all about Jesus Christ. The spirit of prophecy is Jesus Christ. And Hebrews takes us in the New Testament and points us back to the Old Testament to explain and help us understand who Jesus Christ is. Verse 11 says that he is not ashamed to call them his brethren. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. But verse 12 saying, pointing us back to the Old Testament, to Psalm 22, it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. These are the words of Jesus spoken in Psalm 22, that I will declare thy name, the name of the Father in heaven, unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. You see, the Son of Man praised God the Father in heaven. As, as a man, as one of us, he praised the Father in heaven. But he was worthy of that same exact praise that we would praise the Father for. He is equal with God. He is God. So he praising the Father as a man, and yet he was praised by men as God. As we read this morning, when he came into Jerusalem, what did they cry? Hosanna. Hosanna. This is the King of David. This is the Messiah. This is the one from heaven that was promised to come down for us. Pharisees didn't like that, did they? We read how they said to Jesus, you hear what these say? You hear what they're saying of you? They're claiming you're, you're the Son of God. They're claiming you came down from, they, they're saying that you are one with the Father. They were upset. They were displeased by the worship that came to Jesus. But did Jesus turn that worship away? Never. Jesus never turned worship away when men came to worship him because he is God. Though he praised the Father in heaven as one of us, as a man. Notice verse 13, he gives us another example from the Old Testament. 
This comes perhaps from uh, uh, the Psalms, or there are passages in Isaiah as well that this points towards. But verse number 13, it says, And again, I will put my trust in him. These are the words of Jesus being brought out of the Old Testament that Jesus said, I will put my trust in him, in God the Father, Jesus as a son of man, being a son and a brother of us. He was one that trusted in the Father. When he died on the cross, what were his words? Some of the last words that Jesus ever spoke before he went into the grave for you and I. Father, into thy hands commend my spirit. He was trusting in the Father. He never raised words of of hatred and, and, and contention and judgment against those who unjustly condemned him. He went as a sheep to the slaughter because he trusted in his Father to bring justice and to bring salvation. He trusted in the Father as a son of man, as one of us, but yet he is, he, he is worthy of that exact same trust. Jesus said to his disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. Claim me he's one with the Father. He, he is worthy to be trusted in the same level of, of confidence and trust that you put in God the Father, you can put in Jesus Christ for your salvation because he is one with the Father. One more example that's given to us here of the Old Testament in that it says, and again, behold, I in the children which God hath given me. This goes back to the prophecy of Isaiah when God gave him children that signified uh, God's judgment and, and the hope of God being with Israel in his day. Isaiah spoke these words of himself and of his children, and yet they were prophetic of the words of Jesus Christ himself, saying, Father, you have given me children to save, children to redeem from their sin. And, and he praised God for sending him sanctifying him to come and die for mankind. But yet Jesus is worthy of the same power as God in heaven. It was Jesus who, coming to earth, said that I will lay my life down and I will take it again. Why? Because he, being God, had authority over sin and death, the grave and hell. He is God, though he was made into our glory, the, the glory of man, and into our flesh. Mark chapter 2 talks about the story of the man who was paralyzed, let down through the, through the housetop. And when he, coming there before them, sought to raise that man up from that bed to walk on his feet. But he knew what was in the heart of man. And he knew that, it, that, that he being God, if he were just to, to, to say to the man, thy sins be forgiven thee, and he never did anything beyond that, that's all the man would need. The man would have new legs. The man would have a new body in heaven one day. If all Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. You are my child. That's all the man would need. But Jesus said, in order that you may know that the Son of Man hath power, he said, rise up and walk, proving he's not just the Son of Man, he is the Son of God. So many times, and the reason that the Pharisees took Jesus and nailed him to the cross with those that were with them was because Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews. He claimed to be God himself. And they took him and crucified him. And yet being taken captive and in, in being made lower than the angels and in becoming, the, in, in, in becoming a, a, a son of a brother of one of us, he going to the cross and rising from the grave became the way of salvation. That all who believe in him have a way through death, have a way of escape from sin and judgment through Jesus Christ. It, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of motive to live for Jesus. You know, there, there are those of us who uh, perhaps we fare well amongst one another. We're favorable in the eyes of others. We, we have a talents and abilities where we've done well in this life. And it's easy for us to, to look at life and say, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to go out and do something with my life. And we get ambitious apart from Jesus Christ to go and do something. But all of that leads to destruction. But then, then there are those who have no ambition 
have no motivation for this life. But I, I identify as a, as a young person that in looking for, uh, out on life, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't know what career path I should choose. I don't know what, uh, what uh, course God has for my life. I, I, ha- I have no desire to leave high school because I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no desire to go out and work because I don't know what I'm going to do with the money that I make. But in finding Jesus, in finding the, uh, the hope and the path that he has blazed, not just for my salvation, but for my life, there's a lot of reason to live when you follow Jesus. There's a lot of hope for this life when you follow Jesus, when you know that he is the one leading you all the way to the Father in heaven. He has, a, he has a plan for your life. He has a chart for your life. If you'll get behind him and just follow Jesus.